good day to you, brothers, sisters, friends, and new faces. Welcome to Current Events and Christian Expectations. And today in this podcast, we're going to discuss bipartisan, a word that can potentially mislead us. Today, we're going to lead off with Proverbs 14, 12. As usual, we'll have several other scriptures that we'll reference and read today, and we'll put those in the overview. So with the word bipartisan and its placement or misplacement in the current culture, let's just dig right in. Right. Bipartisan has become an uh, all-inclusive word <clears throat> for what stands for virtue. Of course, it originated in the government, but it gets into the culture as well in various ways. That a bipartisan, even if you use another name rather than bipartisan, is always a good thing. Let's first start off with this sobering word from Proverbs 14, 12 about certain ways that seem so right and good. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There you go. That's very succinct and terse and uh, pithy and to the point. And it certainly applies to the word bipartisan and the way it can mislead. In the great issues of life, issues that really matter, The only ones that matter. God is never bipartisan. For example, here's an example from the Pharisees who thought they could be bipartisan with God and their pursuit of money. Luke 16, verses 13 through 14. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. There you go. You can't serve God and money. You you said a phrase there. God is not bipartisan. Right. You like that phrase? I do. That <laughs> that'll preach. That, yeah, okay. that, that's that that's probably a title uh, for for this one, I think. Okay. Yeah. I'll I'll go with it. Uh, yes. God and money. Many a bipartisan effort nonetheless has been built on that premise from people in politics and elsewhere. Yet you can do that. Here's the latest bipartisan word in politics. This comes from the Senate Democrats Putting People First website. Uh, Quote, a new analysis from nonpartisan legislative staff shows that 94.48% of bills that passed the legislature in 2022, that's so far this year, I assume, well, they were bipartisan. Of the 308 total bills that passed both chambers so far in 2022, 291 had the yes vote of at least one Republican senator or representative. And, of course, you get one, then you can call it bipartisan. You know, 87% of statistics are made up on the spot. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like that's what they were doing. (laughs) Uh, Precisely. Um, Here's another one from the same website. Quote, we applaud Senator Cornyn. Now, he's a Republican. Senator Cinema, she's a Democrat. Representative uh, uh, Cuellar, he's a Democrat. And Representative Gonzalez for their leadership in introducing the Bipartisan Border Solutions Act of 2021. The sharp increase in the number of individuals crossing our southern border and the severe overcrowding at our nation's border facilities present a set of circumstances that Congress cannot ignore. Our leaders need to address this pressing situation. The only way that meaningful policy changes will be enacted if Republicans and Democrats work together to achieve those results for the American people. End of quote. Okay. <laughs> At last check, it's still somewhere in Congress, <laughs> probably buried in some committee. From over a year ago. <laughs> yes. Almost two years now. So, and, and what will the end be? What, how do these things happen? Here's a verse from Proverbs that's been very helpful to me to sort things out. Proverbs 10, 19. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. There you go. When words are many, transaction is not, uh, transgression is not absent. Um, yeah, and you have a lot of words going around, of course, obviously in politics. So I think talking something to death uh, is not a solution. Clearly, this by partisan attempt, we read above there, is going nowhere. However, the point in all of this is, be bipartisan. Here's a collection of quotes from all sides, 
on bipartisanship. First one. Uh, this is from Christopher Hitchens. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. Well-known atheist, wrote books uh, about God, against God, and so forth, so on. And yet, uh, for some odd reason, I sort of like the guy, and he does hit the nail on the head once in a while. Uh, he does good critical thinking. He was one of the first to rise up and talk about, honestly, about the uh, Muslim terrorist situation going on in the country. Here's what he says, quote, The whole point about corruption in politics is that it can't be done or done properly without a bipartisan consensus. Mm. So think about that. Here's one, though, from Colin Powell, who passed on a couple years ago. Uh-huh. It's nice to say, let's be bipartisan, but we're a partisan nation. We were raised as a partisan nation. I, I like that. Yeah. Now, I don't know what he would think today about the military and some of the bipartisan stunts they pulled recently. But yeah. Here's one from Harry Truman. Whenever a fellow tells me he's bipartisan, I know he's going to vote against me. <laughs> that sounds exactly like uh, Mr. Truman. Yeah. Now, Newt Gingrich, well-known in politics, uh, says this. Nothing gets done in Congress unless it's bipartisan. And the reason that matters is that it's a function of reality. End of quote. Okay, I, I see that. And I like Newt, but that doesn't tell us whether what's done is good or bad. No, it's just watered down and weak. Yeah. 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 Um, here's one from one of my favorite economists, Thomas Sowell, great economist, a man worth paying attention to. Quote, as a rule of thumb, congressional legislation that is bipartisan is usually twice as bad as legislation that is partisan. <laughs> and then another fella, again, like uh, Christopher Hitchens, not a Christian, not even interested in Christianity, George Carlin, but I found his humor to be incisive and insightful uh, in many ways because he did hit it both sides, left and right. The word bipartisan, says George, usually means some larger than usual deception is being carried out. I like that. Yeah. Well, when these two totally different people agree, George and Thomas, I think we're on the right track. But these are voices crying in the wilderness. What we are left with in the culture at large is the impression that if an action isn't bipartisan, it must, by definition, be wrong, be bad. It's not good. Note this from three dictionaries defining the word partisan. Partisan has become a dirty word. Uh, first one, it comes from dictionary.com. Definition for partisan. An adherent or supporter of a person, group, party, or cause, especially especially a person who shows a biased emotional allegiance. Then we got uh, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defining partisan. A firm, adherent to a, a firm adherent to a party, faction, cause, or person, especially when exhibiting blind prejudice and unreasoning allegiance. <laughs> and then this one from Cambridge Dictionary, again defining the word partisan. Strongly supporting a person, principles, or political party, often without considering or judging the matter very carefully. Partisan has become a nasty word. That's why bipartisan is a virtuous word. Mm. So how did partisan get to be a dirty word? We're going to look into that. Here's the Christian expectation. We must not be lulled into the use of the word bipartisan as a virtue. Let us stick with the partisan solutions to life. The primary concern for Christians is not allowing the vocabulary of the world to conform us to its values. Uh, we say that because uh, words come into the culture, and, they, and so often words are deceitful. We pick them up, we use them, and we don't realize what we're wielding. Listen to this from Paul in Romans 12, too. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Greek word metamorphosis. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's how we think mm. that produces what we do. Uh, J.B. Phillips' old paraphrase of this verse, don't let the world squeeze you into its own mold, is appropriate here. Here's the problem. Just because both sides agree doesn't mean agreement 
their agreement or what proceeds from it is good, righteous, holy, good. Note the following, Mark 3, verse 6. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. That was bipartisan. That was bipartisan, yeah. exactly. Uh, Jesus had just healed the man with a withered hand. and um, They hated each other. Yes, that group. they yeah. did. Um, so here we are, two groups, the Pharisees and the Herodians, normally opposed to each other. The Pharisees, of course, eventually do not want any Roman rule. They're against that. While the Herodians, because, hey, they're named after Herod, <laughs> who worked for Rome, yeah. uh, did want that. But they both see Jesus as a threat to the country's stability, so they join in their bipartisan hatred of him. Likewise, here's another one dealing with Herod himself and Pilate from Luke 23, verse 12. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with each other. Yes, that's when Jesus was going through the trial before the crucifixion and being hauled before uh, Caiaphas and Ananias and the Sanhedrin, and then to Herod and to Pilate and back to Pilate and so forth and so on, we find out that Luke says Herod and Pilate became friends. Why is this? Because both of them saw Jesus as not necessarily a threat, didn't, didn't see him as a threat. Herod has agreed with Pilate. Pilate is glad to have this support. Remember, the word is bipartisan, and yet uh, Jesus, of course, will be condemned. In Acts 4, Psalms 2 is quoted about the nations and peoples agreeing, being bipartisan, to rebel against the Lord and his anointed, who turns out to be Jesus. This is Acts 4, 27 through 28. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. There you go. The early Christians were partisan. And indeed, coming from different cultures, now we just read a verse that talked about the Gentiles, the Jews, Israel, Pilate, and all those people. But keep in mind, Christians were partisan, and they came from different cultures, Jew and Gentile, made partisan by one goal, one mission, one vision, we have this wonderful summing up of that in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Greek nor Jew, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There you go. The ethnic group, economic group, and gender groups, which is all split up today, opposing each other. Yeah. You know, um, that's what we got here. And they were a mixed multitude for sure. You had Jew and Gentile, you had rich and poor, slave and free, male and female, um, but they were all one, partisan, partisans for Jesus. Uh, today, bipartisans try to co-opt the church for their hidden agendas. So, as Christians, we must first consider what is first, whether in politics or in life, one must decide what is non-negotiable. Mm not to be given away for the sake of being bipartisan so you can be viewed as someone who doesn't rock the boat. Partisan people rock the boat. And so they're bad. According to Scripture, we must always be sure we have chosen the right partisan value to live by. We all know the story of Genesis 3, the temptation of the serpent to Eve, the conversation and what happened. Listen to these words in Genesis 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Right. What we have here is Satan trying to bring them on his side uh, for a bipartisan effort against God. And there's Adam with Eve, and Adam should have been partisan for God. He should have said, Eve, this is... Not right, we can't do this. But he becomes bipartisan with Eve. Yeah, Eve gets a bad rap, but Adam was standing right there with her. Adam, yes, yeah. Adam stands condemned. Uh, and Adam all die. Yeah. In Christ all made alive. So uh, Adam should have been partisan for God, but he becomes bipartisan with Eve. And that means, pay attention to this, by doing so, they both became partisans for Satan. Mm -hmm. 
bipartisan Ooh. when it's not what it's supposed to be, and most of the time it isn't, at least in the world of life and faith, yeah. you become partisans on the side of Satan. The original sin was bipartisan and thus partisan for the devil. I remember that quote by uh, George Carlin, uh, who said, uh, the word bipartisan usually means some larger than usual deception is being carried <laughs> out. So um, that was Satan's way of getting to Eve, who in turn got at him. Okay. To be a follower of the Lord, we've got to be partisan. And that's made clear in several places. And let's take a look at them. Here is a quote from Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 and 20. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to J Jacob, to give them. All right, being partisan for God means to get the blessings. But the great issues of life, the ones that matter, that's where Satan is going to be doing his deception. You know, it's either darkness or light. It's either the broad road or the narrow road. Um, mm -hmm. It's either Jesus or the devil. Um, for the whole nation, no bipartisan values, just partisan values. Not life and just a little death, but life full-blown if you want to avoid death full-blown. Then, of course, we have the famous incident with Elijah on Mount Carmel and the uh, prophets of Baal and the situation there that happened. Here's that story <clears throat> as to being partisan or not from 1 Kings 18, 20 and 21. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Limping between two opinions, which is sort of the history of Israel in the Old Testament. Um, being bipartisan in what truly matters cannot last. For we're always limping between the two polarities. You know, of life and death, light and darkness. So, if we're bipartisan, Limping around, that means we're partisan for idolatry, as you shall see. Limping between the two, but that's still where Satan wanted them to be. Well, we need one thing. We need to concentrate on just one thing. That's what partisan means. One thing. You're sold on that. Listen to how Paul explains it in Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That one thing, that one thing. Paul is like David in Psalm 27. David says, one thing I seek to be in your temple and to behold your beauty, Lord, all the days of my life. Uh, Mary decides to sit at the feet of Jesus with the male disciples and learn the teaching of Jesus. Well, Margaret works in the kitchen and gets finally frustrated and angry and comes out, Lord, can't you see what's going on here? Tell her to get in the kitchen with me. But Jesus says, in effect, uh, Martha, Martha, you got many issues going on. I see that. But Mary has chosen that one thing, mm -hmm. and it will not be taken from her. We could go on, but it's clear. For those of us of faith, there's only one way to commitment, one life that matters. The Pharisees wanted the church to be bipartisan, part Mosaic and part Christian. We find this in Acts 15. Listen to these verses, Acts 15, 1 and then verse 6. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. So they came, <clears throat> they came to discuss it. Uh, are we going to have a bipartisan committee here, uh, Mosaic and Christian combined? How are we going to go? And, of course, everyone gets up. I mean, uh, Paul talks for a while. Others, no doubt, talk. Uh, eventually, Peter takes a partisan stand when he discusses how God chose him to take the message to the Gentiles, Cornelius and his family, 
um, some time before this, and how that makes Christians partisan. Salvation by grace, by faith, following Jesus. This is from Acts 15, verses 8 through 11. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. That's right. The Mosaic Law had been twisted and perverted, etc., became a yoke you couldn't bear. And now they have the clarity of the cross of Jesus and salvation, uh, grace through faith. So that's the case, partisan. And that was solved, and the Pharisees, of course, would continue to <laughs> not like the answer and would uh, follow Paul and others around uh, for some time trying to destroy the churches that had been uh, put together based on a partisan fact named Jesus. However, God's people in the past have been compromised in the bipartisan way. We want to look at the uh, Old Testament, great picture of the Old Testament way in which that happened, and then show you a modern example in the New Testament of how the same thing's going on. So listen to Randy as he reads 2 Kings 17, uh, verses 32 through 34, and then verse 41. They also feared the Lord and appointed from among themselves all sorts of people as priests of the high places who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. So they feared the Lord, but also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from among whom they had been carried away. To this that day they do according to the former manner. They do not fear the Lord, and they do not follow the statutes or the rules or the law of the, or the commandments that the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. So these nations feared the Lord and also served their carved images. Their children did likewise, and their children's children, as their fathers did, so they do to this day. Right. That's the end result of bipartisan religion tearing one's life apart because you're not partisan as you should be. Thing is, they would use their idols, and their idols have names, and of course the Lord had the name, you know, Yahweh, Jehovah, and um, they were comfortable moving back and forth and didn't see any, any problem with it. Mm. Here's a contemporary example of this. Uh, I experienced back in the 1970s, some of us listening out there can, I'm sure, go back that far. <laughs> I was driving down I-75 uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, I uh, listened to the radio on my way to work, driving south, coming into the greater Cincinnati area. And uh, I was a fan of the Beatles. And um, George Harrison came on with a song I had not heard called My Sweet Lord. My Sweet Lord, how I want to know you, how I want to see you, you know, my sweet Lord. And I thought, well, that, well, praise the Lord for George. I didn't think he could sing songs like that. Um, but here's the problem. I found out later, My Sweet Lord is... <laughs> He's not referring to Jesus. So here is a way of using a song to get others to join up in a bipartisan manner, not knowing that you're being bipartisan in a sense that really makes you partisan on the side of the devil. I know it gets confusing, doesn't it? Well, that's what happens when these things take place. This is from Bing.com talking about this song. Quote, simply put, George Harrison's My Sweet Lord is a religious praise song. The narrative is based on the desire of the singer to see the Lord. See, that's what David wanted back there in Psalm 27 I just referred to. But back to Bing.com. And while the word Lord is used as a general term in reference to the Creator globally, from a specific religious perspective, Harrison is singing to Krishna, the lead deity of the Hindu faith. Yes. Well, how is this bipartisan? It isn't. It's partisan for Krishna by using a terminology that disguises the true intent of the song so others would sing it not knowing its intent and content. So, in that sense, it becomes bipartisan. Like Israel of old, for the Lord while being for idolatry. Well, the goal of the bipartisans is this, to make us think they're on our side and we on theirs, but with deception there is only one side. 
Today, bipartisans try to co-opt the church for their hidden agendas. Here's a, another contemporary example from well-meaning people, uh, which I dealt with back um, about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, it's called the Church for Those Who Don't Like Church Movement. <laughs> Perhaps some of you have heard that out there. We had board board, uh, billboards around Cincinnati yeah. advertising. Yeah, I, I remember it. Uh, yeah. The Church for Those Who Don't Like Church. Uh, a fellow I read after, Kenneth Myers, I liked what he said. He said, what if you saw a sign that said NASCAR for those who don't like NASCAR? <laughs> uh, if you're thinking like I'm thinking and Randy's thinking, yeah, NASCAR wouldn't be NASCAR. Yeah. And the church wouldn't be the church if such logic is followed. Imagine saying the Bible for those who don't like the Bible. <laughs> a try to be bipartisan with the world will not work because we'll be presenting a Jesus for those who don't like Jesus, which will always be a Jesus plus something else, never Jesus only, just a worldly, bipartisan Jesus. And weak and watered down. And weak and, and watered down. Now, this very problem arose, believe it or not, in the church at Corinth, and Paul addresses it this way. So listen to these uh, verses from 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. There you go. They still use the word gospel, still use the word Jesus, still talk about the Spirit, but something's been compromised, this bipartisan mm. business. Notice Paul says you're being led away from your pure devotion. That's partisanism, purity. One thing, Satan's tactics never change. What he did with Eve, he did with the church at Corinth. So, because they were not as partisan, that is the church at Corinth, as they should have been, they ended up being intimidated by the enemies of the gospel. And this is what happens. Intimidation. You've got to stand strong. Stand as one, as Paul says to the Philippians, uh, Philippians in uh, chapter 1. And not become uh, bipartisan, which is partisan for the devil. Paul is talking about the boasting that these people have done to deceive the church at Corinth. And he says, well, I guess I'm going to have to boast too to show you I can outboast those people. I have to be a fool. But there again, Paul says, you guys like fools. So listen to what Randy reads now in 2 Corinthians 11, 19 through 21. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For if you bear it, if someone makes slaves of you or devours you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face, to my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But... Whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Yes, and he goes on to talk about his, ultimately, his weakness in Christ that makes him strong. Um, but they were being intimidated by these people because they could not be partisan, so they end up being bipartisan, which is partisan for the, for the devil. Let us not get our values from the political culture, but from the word of God, and not compromise our faith for the supposed virtue of being bipartisan. So, what is the ultimate partisan value we're supposed to have? Listen to Jesus' prayer for his own, the longest prayer of Jesus in the Bible, right before he goes to the cross. We want to look at the first three verses of John 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. There you go. That is clear. It's uh, unambiguous. It's not partisan. It's partisan truth to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Uh, it's never Jesus plus something else. Never a bipartisan Jesus. Our part partisanship is forever for him, and that's the Christian expectation. And God is not bipartisan. And God is not bipartisan. <laughs>
Thanks, Jim. We have got a lot to think about, and I'm sure there might be questions or comments about it. And we'd love to hear your questions or comments or even your requests uh, for new topics. So please send your questions, comments, and requests to events and expectations at gmail.com. That's the word events, the word and, and the word expectations at gmail.com. We'll use your comment or question on air where possible. We will definitely speak about the topic you request, and we will always answer you. This has been Current Events and Christian Expectations, and until next time, keep looking up.